this morning. This morning I'm going to talk about uh, recovery and social identity. It's made slightly harder by the fact that this screen isn't working, so I can't... What appears on the screen up here and what I talk about will now bear no relationship to each other what, whatsoever, because I can't actually see what I'm supposed to be saying. Um, right, so I'll, st I'll, I'll do a little bit of some of the stuff that I talked about yesterday. Um, and I'll do uh, a, a bit of building, but you know, for, ah, it's appeared magically. Some, some magical person has switched this on, so that's great. Um, but really what the, the primary focus of today's talk is about belonging, is about social identity and what being a member of a group means to people in terms of a recovery journey. And we've known for a long time that one of the things that happens with people in recovery is their identity changes. How they see themselves and how they present themselves changes from a stigmatised and excluded identity to something much more positive. And it's essential for both convincing yourself of the positivity and meaningfulness of the change, but also of how you present yourself to the world and engaging in the world as a different kind of a person. And that identity change is something we've known a lot about. And I'm going to argue, as I do all the time around this stuff, that that identity change is as much about the groups you belong to as the individual process of change. Right. Let's start from a premise that I mentioned yesterday, which is the basic idea of social identity theory is belonging to groups is good for you. Groups provide social support, access to information and access to resources. But beyond that, what belonging to a group does is it provides you with a kind of lens through which you can see the world. The group has values, norms, beliefs, rules and roles. And as the more you immerse yourself in the group, the more important the group is to you, the more those rules, identities matter. And I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I'm involved in that are critical to this idea of the group is much more than the sum of individuals. Being a part of a group provides people with much, much more than just each individual contribution. The, what we call the emerging properties of groups are critical to understanding how groups work and how they evolve. Individuals derive their sense of self through membership of the social groups they value and these social identities provide a critical source of support. And why, is, why is this important? Because we know that group belonging provides people with a sense of well-being and all the stuff that people talked about last night and it was just fabulous for me, that sense of collectivism collective identity, and I don't really need to tell you about this because it's been such a dominant theme of this conference and all of the activities round about it, is that sense of belonging. That sense of belonging to something you value is critical to physical and psychological well-being. In contrast, if you belong to groups that are stigmatised, excluded and marginalised, it damages your self-esteem. It damages your sense of self-respect and decency and dignity. The group may be bonded strongly together, but its sense of exclusion has long-term detrimental effects on your quality of life and your well-being. And we know from a number of studies that group belonging prevents and alleviates depression, decreases a sense of social isolation, helps build self-esteem. It helps people exit from homelessness. And I'll come back to the question of how it does that later. And it preserves cognitive health in older adults. In other words, we know that when you are a member of valued and valuable groups, it does practical things for you. But much, much more important, it is psychologically protective and it is physically protective. So, the more groups you belong to, the more diverse groups you belong to, and the more positively valued groups you belong to, the better your life expectancy. That has nothing to do with criminals, nothing to do with 
alcoholics, nothing to do with drug addicts. These are rules about the general population. And in a 2011 study, meta-analysis, it was better for people to grow, to develop more friendship than it was for them to cut down smoking, drinking or obesity. It is better for your life expectancy to get new friends than to stop drinking or smoking. That is not an advert on behalf of Imperial Tobacco, however. That doesn't mean keep smoking, just get more friends. But in terms of respective effects on well-being, a sense of belonging, friendship, membership of groups is more important than any of those other things you can do. And that just gives you some sense of context about what we're talking about here. That for people who, come, who are coming out of addiction, who are socially isolated, with low self-esteem, low self-efficacy, and having been members of discriminated against and excluded groups, the transition to positively valued groups is hugely important to their well-being. And I'm going to give you my favourite example of a project that I've been involved in that has done exactly that with the most astonishing effects uh, shortly. And I'm just going to come back to a couple of the studies I mentioned yesterday and interpret them in terms of this. And, uh, yesterday I talked about a study by Mark Lift taking people out of alcohol detox who either got randomised to standard aftercare or to um, network support. And network support meant could you add one clean and sober person to the, the social network. What I didn't mention was all of those network support people were recruited from Alcoholics Anonymous. And what they effectively did was they tried to engage people in mutual aid support. Why is that important? Because people go from having a socially isolated effect to a belonging to a group effect. A belonging to a group that's supporting their aim of trying to remain abstinent. That's why that study worked. And the second study I compared it to was this meta-analysis of why self-help groups work. The key point about this is these bottom boxes. Why, why are Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Smart Recovery effective? Because what they are doing is getting people to engage in a group, the rules, norms and expectations of which are, you will not drink. And if you want to stay as part of that group, you have to abide by those rules, norms and values. And that is called informal social control. So, in the largest ever addiction study done, Project Match, the biggest predictor of long-term recovery was switching your social network from networks that were supportive of drinking to networks that were supportive of recovery. In other words, people who did well in Project Match, regardless of the treatment they were assigned to, were the people whose social networks stopped being about drinking and started being about recovery and sobriety. It's not complicated, because if you like your friendship network, you will abide by the rules of it. And that's part of this process of change. And that takes, this all derives from this idea of a social cure. Belonging to, group, to groups is good for you. It provides all of these kind of things about roles and norms and values. But what the study of both homelessness and addiction has, has led us to realise quite clearly is not all groups are equal. All the original work was done in old people and physical illness where the basic rule was groups are good. What the start of studies on homelessness and addiction led us to realise was groups aren't all equivalently good. And that groups that have no access to social resources no access to positive, um, positive status and well-being actually are detrimental to quality of life and, and health, irrespective of what they do to people's substance use. That they, both the amount society values a group and the amount you yourself value a group determine its effect on your self-esteem and quality of life. All groups aren't equal. And the more valued and prized the groups you belong to are, the better effect it has. But the other point 
which I guess is critical because I'm sure there were people in the audience who are both supportive of 12 step groups and skeptical about them. One of the key points about the social cure and social identity model is the more different groups you belong to, the better. And from our own life and recovery work, people who were just members of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous didn't have as good psychological health, physical health, or quality of life as people who belong to a whole lot of different kinds of groups. So multiple diverse groups is much better for your well-being than is just belonging to one group, no matter what that group is. And this, these are critical points in terms of this model of social identity uh, theory and its impact on how we understand the recovery process. Because one of the things that's become very clear in my own work is, as people transition from uh, active addiction to that, that kind of relapsing cycle in early treatment to long-term recovery, the groups they belong to change and how much they value and commit themselves to the group also change. Because one of the other points about Alcoholics Anonymous that's important to say is, turning up for meetings confers only the slightest benefit on people. If you want to benefit from Alcoholics Anonymous or Smart Recovery, it's active participation, it's chairing meetings, it's helping with the tea and coffee, it's immersion in the group, active membership, not passive involvement, that's the critical predictor. Because that's about going from being a peripheral member of a group to a central or prototypical member of, of the group. And the more central you are in the group, the more you abide by the rules of the group. I'm sorry this is in danger of having boring theory stuff attached to it. I should have had a health warning about this. Uh, so, our model. Our model, the social identity model of recovery, is essentially about this idea that there is a tipping point. There is a tipping point that happens typically post-treatment. When people are, have what's called a torn identity, there's part of them kind of getting pulled back to their old friendship networks and their using networks. And then there's another part of them that's looking to the future that wants to think about their family and jobs and houses and all those kind of things that are going to uh, move people forward. And, and the, the argument from our work is that one of the core roles for professionals is enabling access and enabling engagement with positive social groups to tip that balance. Because your job is not to make people join groups, but to expose them to groups that once they are exposed to, the value of the groups will draw them in and then will act as a protective effect against them going back to the groups that are likely to lead to relapse. This is the power of the group. And there will always be those torn identity conflicts where people will have a bit of themselves that say, I miss my old pals. I could do with a night out with them. I want, I want to go back to that. But the more they are drawn into pro-social, meaningful groups, the more bound they are to the rules, values and norms, and the more protective that is. And in essence, the challenge here is about the middle box. Once people make that transition to non-using groups, to positive pro-social groups in the final stage, they don't need any external assistance. It's in this central point where the, the, the torn, conflicted part arises, that the role of professionals to some extent, but critically peers, is about introducing people to social learning role models. Oh, I've started this business again, I've hit the microphones. Um, where where the, the critical role is to expose individuals to attractive role models, because the attractiveness of the role model, and that will almost always be a peer, that will almost always be somebody else in recovery who's accessible and realistic and you can aspire to be like them. They are the bridges. They will be the, t the fulcrum or the tipping point that get people over that threshold. I'm not going to talk much about empirical evidence. But this is a paper we did a couple of years ago um, where what we, what we attempted to do here was to start looking at how people's addict identity changes and how their recovery identity changes over the time they were in therapeutic communities. And this is 
uh, research that was done in a, a therapeutic community called Logan House in Queensland uh, in Australia. The green line is their identification with the therapeutic community. The red line is the pink line is their identification with uh, substance use um, so substance using groups, substance use populations. And what we found was that the more the substance using identity decreases, and the, uh, this is just over time, so it's how they change over time. This was up a bit, this was down a bit, this up a bit here for the recovery, uh, for the TC identity, down a bit for the addict identity. The more their TC identity went up, the more their addict identity went down, the longer they were retained in the programme. In other words, moving away from the addiction identity towards the identity of the TC, this is where you belong, this is where you want to be, predicted how long they would stay. And we know from lots of TC studies, the longer you stay in a TC, the better you'll do once you leave. And, but much more critically, the follow-up study was basically that, astonishingly, um, changes in identity um, predicted a third of the variance of treatment outcomes. In other words, the, one of the strong, well, virtually the strongest predictor we had of how people changed their substance use after they left the TC was the extent to which they switched from an addict identity to a recovery identity. So that the notion of identity change was a massive predictor of treatment outcome. And what we started doing with this work was to say, look, one of the things that we are hypothesizing is that recovery is a, what we call a transitional identity. That ultimately, we don't want people to be, in, to be professional recovery folk for the rest of their lives. We ultimately want them to be workers, neighbours, fathers, mothers, partners, um, what, football supporters, golfers, whatever they do. Not recovery people. And there's quite a strong argument that says recovery identity should be powerful for a number of years and they should give way to these multiple diverse, just normal, everyday, aspirational identities. In other words, recovery is a, a, a powerful identity for people to have to drag them away from an addict identity. But it shouldn't be forever. People who are, and in 12-step language, people who are still attending 90 meetings in 90 days, 10 years after they've become abstinent, we would worry about their well-being because they haven't done that transition to normal identities. And there's a theory that says, why should people go to 12-step meetings? For the coffee afterwards, so they start finding out what other folk do in their spare time and what other folk do for work and all that kind of thing, to develop those multiple diverse social identities and belongings. That any single identity is fragile, and multiple identities are protective. And that's the point of this chart which I showed yesterday, which is basically how does this work? How this works is because there are three things that affect each other. Your own personal world, your own personal capital and resources, which is the left-hand box, the social world you live in, and the opportunity and access to resources. In other words, to go back to my example of getting kids coming out of uh, criminal justice in Newcastle in the North East, getting them playing football. Well, the problem with them was they were generally excluded and marginalised drug users and offenders with low personal capital. Their social networks consisted of other low personal and social capital drug users and offenders from the same group. So they had no access to any of these normal connections with the community and resources in the community. As they switched to recovery, their social networks and the diversity of groups they belong to expand. And through those extended networks, they start having access to stuff they never previously had access to. They find out about things like courses, like houses, because uh, the northeast cities in England all had regeneration efforts. But if you are socially excluded, firstly, you don't find out about that stuff. And secondly, even if you do, you end up thinking, it's not for scum like me. As you start seeing yourself as a different person, 
you then start to see one, that these things are viable for you because your self-esteem is going up, your sense of personal quality of life is going up, but you know people who find out about stuff like that and who can act as the bridges into those things we know make a difference. Positive relationships, jobs, uh, meaningful activities, volunteering, community participation, so that these are the things that matter. Right. This is my favourite project that I currently am involved in. I do projects all over the place. Jobs, Friends and Houses is a social enterprise that was set up by Lancashire Police. And it's a social enterprise for uh, drug and alcohol users coming out of prison. What is the point of Jobs, Friends and Houses? Regardless of people's skills, qualifications or competence, and regardless of the length of their criminal record, the idea is that you say to people just before they come out of prison, we are going to invite you to develop the skills to build your own house. It's a social enterprise, so it's not a charity, it's not a government-run project. It's a for-profit organisation where people come out of prison, they do a six-week health and safety in the, in the building site course, and then they start apprenticeships in joinery, in to be an electrician, to be a plumber, and they physically build the recovery community. And half of the houses that they build are sold to keep the enterprise afloat, and half of them become recovery housing for people in Blackpool. For Blackpool is a, a, a holiday resort in the northwest of England that was hideously damaged in the 1970s by the start of cheap holiday packages to Spain and Portugal and Italy and Greece from the UK. These were where people used to go in the UK to their holidays, these dreadful British uh, seaside resorts where it rains all the time and there's nothing to do other than slot machines and arcades. And what happened to Blackpool was, as holiday makers stopped going, it gradually became a dumping ground for ex-offenders, mental health, uh, alcohol and drugs, asylum seekers. It became this kind of appalling low social capital place. And all these old hotels and bed and breakfast got incredibly run down. Jobs, Friends and Houses does two things. One, it builds new housing, and two, it takes some of these old properties and renovates them. Why is it appealing to people? It appeals to people because it offers them a pathway to the two things that they are generally excluded from. High quality housing and meaningful activities and jobs regardless of, how, of their criminal record. It offers them a proper apprenticeship and training. Now the other thing that Jobs, Friends and Housing, and incidentally it's run by the police. So it takes a bit of persuading at the start to persuade some of these characters to say, are you going to go and work for the police? And one of the beautiful ironies is, one of the current projects they've got is renovating the police station in Blackpool. And many of the people involved in this project had never been through the front door of Blackpool police station before. They've been in it plenty of times, but generally coming in by a van underneath. But one of the things Jobs, Friends and Houses did, in complete contrast to any anonymity model, is to say we are going to create a positive, high visibility social identity. Everybody is going to wear high visibility t-shirts, jackets, the vans are all, this is a van. For anyone who doesn't know what this is, this is a van. Uh, and it says Jobs, Friends and Houses on the side, everything is logoed. Why? Because what we didn't want was people coming out of prison and doing that thing of walking around the town, looking at their feet, not wanting anybody to recognise them. Because this is where they'd had extensive years of thievery. They wanted to walk around dressed, dressed looking like a builder and a workman, so that there's a sense of pride and dignity and belonging, right from the off. But the other thing that jobs, so when people joined Jobs, Friends and Houses, and I started doing some of the follow-up interviews to say, Right, you've been at Jobs, Friends and Houses now for six months. Um, how much drinking are you doing? How much drug use are you doing? And how much crime are you committing? And they were kind of saying to me, look, you know, we have to be at work for eight o'clock in the morning. We don't get away to five. 
We're generally expected to go to a 12-step meeting or a community activity in the evening. Do you really think I've got any energy for drinking or using or thieving after that? I scarcely make it to my bed after that. What's important about jobs, friends and houses is it creates a visible, strong social identity of pride. It creates almost a community-based therapeutic community. People can see from the day they start that this is given back. They are given back to the community. They are given back to other people in recovery by building houses. And they are doing something pro-social and useful. For the community, it transforms eyesore properties that have been dreadfully run down, abandoned or misused properties into things that are visually attractive and improves the physical quality of the environment. It's not comedy jobs. And Jobs, Friends and Houses operates on the basis of you turn up late, you don't get paid for that day. You leave early, you don't get paid for that day. This is learning about harsh realities. of, But that gives people a sense of pride. That if they do it, they're not doing something that's set up under some project where you can turn up if you fancy it. This is a proper job for people. And it engages individuals who have failed and been failed by the treatment system. And what do we find? The longer folks stayed with jobs, friends and houses, the less drinking they had, the fewer adverse health system, uh, symptoms they had, the better recovery capital they had, the better quality of life they had, and the stronger social identification they had. It's also important to say for the first 45 or so people that we evaluated through the, the first year of this, this was not some kind of uh, low-hanging fruit, easy population. This was a long-term problematic recidivistic group. And this is almost the banker slide. The next two slides are the key slides. So of the group of 45 people, they had a total of 1,142 recorded offences in the police national computer. Um, and they did a total of 176 episodes of imprisonment. Since starting, in the first year of Jobs, Friends and Houses, this group of people uh, had a total of five reported offences. Now, some of, uh, the lady who introduced me mentioned the stigma of being a criminology professor. One of the things that being a criminology professor mean, means is, you do not ask people how many offences they have committed. So the, the answers are not perhaps always the most reliable. So what we used for this was recorded offences on the police national computer system. So this is, so it's not a good measure because if you're a good criminal the answer will be none. But for most people the answer is not none. What we had was basically a, 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 a pre-jobs, friends and houses annual recorded offence rate of 2.46. In the first year of Jobs, Friends and Houses, the recorded offence rate was not, not 0.15. In other words, there was a 94% reduction in recorded offences in this population. Now, again, without wishing to offend anyone from a therapeutic background or anyone from the criminal justice system, no amount of prison talking therapy or any of these things will create anything like the effect of giving people pride, decency, a job and a house. 94% reduction in offending. Naturally that is not what appealed to the British government. What appealed to the British government was the fact that over this group of people in year one the total saving to the public purse was £822,000. In other words, what we measured was the cost of police involvement, prison imprisonment, ambulance attendances, emer uh, emergency department attendances, costs of benefit, and the flip side of that, the fact that these guys were now all paying tax, many for the first time in their lives, and paying bills. So one person said to me at the follow-up evaluation, I can't believe this. You switch the tap on and water comes out. And some Egypt tells me I have to pay for it. What on earth is that all about? So if people were beginning to discover the harsh realities of life, that you have to pay for your water and your electric, it doesn't just magically appear. But they were doing stuff that was reintegrating it and meaningful for them. 
But what they also did was, it had a contagion effect across the community. And this is a terribly drawn diagram for me. But what Jobs, Friends and Houses did was, it created a network of connectedness at the group level. So people from Jobs, Friends and Houses were involved in mutual aid groups, but they were also involved in peer-based community groups. So every Saturday, there's a family recovery barbecue in Blackpool to get like kids of folk in recovery uh, meals. They, they had links to treatment and broader well-being. They had very strong links to the business community. They had links to sports, art, and recreation. And they had links to employment, sorry, sport, arts, and recreation. And they had links to employment, training, and education. In other words, it created this network of connectedness. So while the job in the house was the central part, it also offered people pro-social, personalised, meaningful activity. So a couple of the lads became football coaches for kids. A couple of them got involved in community volunteering activities. There was a choir. So there was all kinds of stuff that kind of fell out of this. But the absolute hub of this is giving people a positive, meaningful social identity. They belong to something that the community saw as valuable and that contributed significantly. And they fortuitously for jobs, friends and houses, there was also one incredibly positive incident where um, when they were waiting to start work one morning, a, a, a landlord from a hotel across the road came running out saying somebody's been murdered in a room. And four of the lads from jobs, friends and houses went in to intervene. And there was a naked man and woman in a hotel room and the man was beating the woman over the head with a pint glass and her face was all smashed up. And the Jobs, Friends and Houses guys intervened and restrained the bloke, and the woman's life was saved. Now the guy who did this, the primary guy who, the primary Jobs, Friends and Houses man, was two months out from serving a 14 year sentence for manslaughter. And in terms of challenging stigma and exclusion in that local community, the positive press coverage that it got was phenomenal. All four of those guys got police commendations. And police, in, in the UK, the police really only give commendations to police officers. So this was an incredible thing about changing relationships and changing status and stigma. And what it does is, it creates a therapeutic landscape of recovery and change. It creates a world not just where those guys do well, but they change the, how the rest of the people in the town, all people with active addiction problems, family members, people struggling to start their recovery journey, how they see the possibility of change. Because here you have this organisation that consists entirely of people with long histories of heroin injecting, crack injecting, street drinking, violence, all forms of criminality, becoming this beacon of hope. So it changes the perception of not just drinking and drug use, but changes the beliefs about what is possible. Because this is a group who are now quite clearly better than well, who live that model of being better than well. And the last thing I'm going to talk about briefly, how you, I know you gave me a threat about time, but have I got five or ten minutes more to finish this? Okay, good, thank you. So, when I finish in New Zealand, I go to Melbourne. And we have a great study where um, we are basically we are taking a group of people, this is funded by the Australian Research Council, where we are mapping social identity change among 309 individuals who started treatment in five therapeutic communities in Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales. So we have Logan House in Mirakai in Queensland, uh, the Buttery in New South Wales and Windana and Odyssey in Victoria. And basically the aim is to measure their social network, social connectedness and belonging when they arrive in the TC, six months later around the time they're due to leave and 12 months later follow up. We're kind of currently in, in discussion with the Australian Research Council about whether we're going to do a two year follow up as well. We're asking folk loads of questions. We're hoping the fact that we annoy them and keep asking them questions doesn't cause anyone to relapse or hit our researchers. Um, and this is, the, this is the thing that we've started doing. This is one of our kind of innovative techniques. And I apologise because this is incredibly sophisticated, uh, high-tech 
uh, research method for which you require bits of paper, um, post-it notes and coloured sticky dots. And what we are trying to do, we started this in a pilot study in Odyssey House uh, three or four years ago. And what we started getting to people to do was each post-it note represents what groups do you belong to. And we got, some people would say things like family and using friends and any or whatever they would say. But what we then got them to do was to colour code the drug use and status of each member of the group. So we classified people as either active problematic users, which was red dots, um, occasional recreational users, non-users, or people in recovery. And we get people to do that, and the lines represent is there kind of coherence and support between groups, or is there conflict between groups? Now what we found when we piloted this was, all six of the folk at, um, at the Odyssey program we, we, we did this with in Benalla, was all six of them had this kind of penny drop moment, which was around, blimey, is that how my social world works? Because if you have a group which is an awful lot of red dots, and you go back to that group, two things are going to happen. One, you will change the behaviour of everyone else in that group, unlikely. Or two, you will conform to the rules, norms and values of that group. And so, if there are groups where substance use and substance use support is high, that group is, is inconsistent with your recovery pathway. And it was astonishing to get people just to visualise, and visualisations help, writing this stuff down is no good. Visualising how group substance activity influences behaviour was making people realise what you have to do about your social networks. And what, there are two points of this. One is, for people who are socially isolated, they need to be assertively linked into positive groups. And two, for people who are engaged in multiple heavy using groups, and that sadly may well include their family, their recovery, recovery relies in part on them moving away from those groups and engaging in groups which are supportive of recovery process. And for people who are coming tomorrow uh, to the workshop, which more fool you if you haven't had enough of me by this point. But anyway, for people who are coming tomorrow to the workshop, we will be doing all this stuff. That will be about the techniques of social identity mapping. And essentially, what this allows the worker to do is basically to start saying, how are you going to manage social network and social identity change? Because remember what I said, how people see themselves and how people they understand the world is a consequence of the groups they belong to. So if you belong to heavy using groups and your identity is immersed in the values of those groups, your identity is inherently, as in this character here, embedded in substance use activity. And for you to, that's a much harder challenge for that person to go back to their own world and hope to meaningfully sustain a recovery. Because every one of the groups they belong to has some element of risk. So this is about who needs to be assertively linked into those positive groups and activities. Back to study. This is boring. This is who we included. There were lots of people. This was the initial sample. This was an initial subsample of 137. And we started saying, so what kind of groups do people belong to? And as you can see at the start of the process, Family is a big thing, um, and only a small number, the bottom uh, left uh, wheel, uh, is that a quarter of people were involved in recovery groups, just under a quarter in work groups, but the primary groups were family groups and using or drinking groups. And so the challenge then for us is to say, how does that change during the TC time and once people have moved out? And the argument, the hypothesis is really simple. If people continue to have these groups as prominent in their social networks after they leave, our bet is they will relax. And we did a, a youth study, which I don't think, which I'm not going to talk about. We did a youth study in, in Melbourne called uh, the Youth Cohort Study. And what we found was that for 150 young people leaving youth services, those who went back to their old social networks relaxed almost exclusively. 
they are not going to change the behaviour of their networks. And to fit in with a social network as a young person, you'll engage in the behaviours. So they relaxed. Second group tried to isolate themselves. So they got rid of their using friends, didn't replace their using friends, and isolated. They didn't offend and they didn't use, but they suffered massive declines in psychological health and psychological well-being. Only those young people who maintained the same number of groups they belonged to, but transitioned from using groups to non-using groups, had a good prognosis in terms of significant reductions in substance use and significant reductions in, 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 in substance use and offending. And this is at the heart of what our model is about. That irrespective of any individual interventions you do, the world is fundamentally social. The groups you belong to may not have written down rules, but they will have informal rules about what behaviours they do and what behaviours are acceptable to be a part of that group. If those groups include substance using activities and pro-substance using activities and the person values those groups, they will relax. If they are going to sustain recovery, and people need to know this, because the point of these maths is not to say, you know, isn't it nice for us to get lots of, lots of coloured dots that fall off bits of paper? But the point for us is to say to, to the clients, look, this is your world. If you want to change that, there can't be red dots appearing when you leave here. Because if there are lots of red dots appearing in the groups you belong to, after you leave here, you will fail. You will not sustain your recovery. And the challenge then is to do all that assertive linkage stuff and is to say, for people who only have red dotted groups, how do you get them involved in other groups that aren't like that? And that transition is a massive, and it's back to my Goya stuff, the get off your arse. You as workers have to get people whose worlds are like that, full of red dots, out into groups which don't involve that kind of stuff. Because if they go back to that world, they aren't going to succeed. This is boring. This is quite boring. And uh, I think I've done enough anyway. I'm flat. Yeah, groups matter. So we'll go on to this. No more correlations. These are correlations and they are really dull. I'll briefly say this. So, the, um, the, the, there are strong relationships between multiple group memberships and personal well being and quality of life. But that for people who had, str so, and there were uh, also strong, the more people saw themselves as an addict, which is uh, this line here, this line here, the more people saw themselves as addicts, their, SI means social identity, the more people saw, saw themselves as an addict or alcoholic, the, um, the lower was their quality of life, the lower was their personal well-being, that's why it's negative signs before them. And the higher was their, um, Matt is their Maudsley addiction profile, physical health, and their psychological, uh, worse was their psychological health. Groups matter. How you understand the world is partly a reflection of the values of the groups you belong to. But groups change people. They can both support and sustain change. Generally belonging to groups is good. But if you belong to stigmatised, excluded and marginalised groups, it has the opposite effect. For people who are attempting to make recovery journeys, their awareness of group process needs to be improved. Because they need to understand that they cannot sit on the margins of groups that are supportive of these behaviours and not relax. Because as your membership of a group relies on you being prototypical, doing the stuff that group does, you have to transition from groups that engage in substance use to groups that are supportive of your recovery. These are incredibly strongly predictive of who will do well and who will not do well. Look, once again, I've talked for far too long. I will now go uh, into a corner and talk to myself for a bit. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of conference today. Thank you once again for inviting me. It has been a fabulous privilege and an honour. If any of you want to see more about this stuff, about social identity mapping and how you do it, please come along tomorrow morning. And thank you so much for your support and your uh, encouragement. Thank you.